Hello everybody and thanks for joining the talk on Divertical Migration from the Deep Scattering Layer in the Bangorilla Uplink System. My name is Tim Dudek and together with my co-authors I'm presenting our research in session 17 unraveling the ecology and biogeochemistry of the mesopelagic zone. So let's get started. As part of the traffic project, we're investigating a traffic transfer efficiency in the Benguela upwelling system, one of the four eastern boundary upwelling systems in the world. Previous research has suggested that there is a difference in fisheries yield between the northern and the southern subsystems, despite having similar primary production rates. Our focus is on the food web structure in this region, going from a normal simplistic food web going from primary producers over zooplankton, small pelagic fish towards top predators, um, which we assume is the case in the south, or a less efficient system that we assume uh, is the case in the north where we have a more diverse intermediate trophic structure uh, with more zooplankton species, different small pelagics, fish species, and so on. But it could also be that there is a dead end scenario with um, a high abundance of salps and jellies. And we're focusing on the epipelagic and shelf area for this project um, using hydroacoustics to monitor the distribution of small pelagic fish and also mesopelagic fish as their abundance has changed and especially mesopelagic fish has become more abundant. During our cruise in 2019, we observed strong acoustic scattering layers offshore. And despite not being the center of our research, we were wondering whether these deep scattering layers and the intense divertical migration that we observed are actually different between the northern and southern subsystems. And which abiotic factors might drive this? What species make up these layers? And could this actually have an influence on the trophic transfer efficiency? And this is the focus on the presentation today. When we look at the biomass in the first 200 meters of the water column as determined by hydroacoustics, we see that the biomass distribution is quite patchy and higher on the shelf area. But what we also notice is that the biomass is higher when the uh, sampling took place during the nights, depicted here as darker black lines. And it's lower during daylight sampling, so daylight acoustic transects. And this is a pattern we see throughout in the south and in, in the north. So we see there's quite an influence um, of daytime sampling on biomass analysis. And the reason for this is the divertical migration from the deep scattering layers in this region. So here depicted an, an echogram of a 72 hour um, station in the southern Benguela subsystem. And we clearly see a deep scattering layer between 400 and 600 meters depth and divertical migration during the night. Interestingly, up to 70% of the total water column biomass is situated in the deep scattering layer during the day, and about 35 to 50% of that layer migrates up to the surface at night. So there's very intensive energy transport going on between the photic zone and the mesopelagic zone. What we also noticed is that in the northern subsystem, the deep scattering layer actually lies about 100 meters high up in the water column compared to the south. And also that this deep scattering layer is less dense and the biomass is more evenly distributed within those 200 meters of um, the deep scattering layers. Whereas in the south, it's much more concentrated right in the middle of the deep scattering layers. But even more interesting, in the north, there is an extensive oxygen minimum zone and the deep scattering layer lies right within this oxygen minimum zone, which happens to be at around 250 meters depth um, in the offshore regions. So we wanted to have a look further into the abiotic factors, whether they actually have an influence on the distribution of the deep scattering layers. So we looked at different 
abiotic influences such as temperature, salinity, but also fluorescence as an indicator of primary production. And this is indicated in the top row here. And you see that there are no significant differences between the N bus and the S bus. So the N bus is always depicted on the um, is the left bar and the S bus is the right bar. Whereas when you look at light, which is usually an indicator for deep scattering layer depth because uh, deep scattering layer organisms want to avoid visual predators, we see that the light conditions are worse, so darker in the northern Bengorilla subsystem compared to the south, and there's a significant differences. This might be due to turbidity, as we see in the lower left-hand corner, the waters in the northern Benguela are more turbid, um, which may be an indicator and influence on the light regime there. We also see in the lower right corner the oxygen level. So this is also an abiotic factor that we investigated because of this oxygen minimum zone. But we cannot compare this statistically to the southern Benguela subsystem because there is no oxygen deficiency. But overall, these factors indicate that light and oxygen are actually the main drivers of deep scattering layer distribution. We also wanted to have a look at the taxonomic composition of the deep scattering layer and the layers that are formed during vertical, by vertical migration. Unfortunately, we were only able to have six halls at two stations in northern Benguela subsystems during the night. And we managed to, to sample several separate layers formed here, for example, at 30 meters depth, 80 meters depth, 200 meters, and at the other stage, 30 and 50 meters depth and 306 meters, which is basically the deep scattering layers. And what we found was that there's quite a difference in composition of these layers. And you can see that Euphorsia hanseni, which is a large krill species, make up the surface layers to up to 90% actually of the biomass. Whereas decapods, for example, stay at depth and do not migrate. Mesopelagic fish can be found at almost every depth and are more evenly distributed um, to, through the water column, which confirms what we saw from other RMT halls. And we also have a smaller krill species, Nematocetus megalops, which is also more evenly distributed in the water column, but shows some signs of migration. So what does that tell us about the difference between the northern and southern subsystems and the tropic transfer efficiency? Well, it allows us to bring up something like an oxygen refugee theory. So in the southern Benguela, as depicted in the right in the diagram here, mesopelagic organisms hide deeper down in the water column in the DSL, migrate up to the surface at night, and then down again to avoid visual predators. In the north, though, we have the oxygen minimum zone and uh, lower light levels, which allows mesopelagic organisms to stay further up in the water column to avoid visual predators. But not only um, do they avoid visual predators by staying in low light conditions, but also by staying in the oxygen minimum zone, where visual predators cannot prey upon them because they need high oxygen concentrations. And this means that krill can be kind of a dead end in the system, but it could also mean that mesopelagic fish have an advantage here because they can actually enter the oxygen minimum zone and feed on the krill. So this means that the energy that krill gets from the surface layers during the night is then transported to, to the depth and where mesopelagic fish can take advantage of that. But then the energy stays kind of in the mesopelagic system as compared in the south. So this means that krill is the most important player here at an intermediate trophic position, but it has some substantial differences between the northern and southern Benguela subsystems. But we are still investigating whether this is really the case and the reason for traffic transfer efficiency. 
to give you an idea about um, our future activities and what's going on at the at the moment um, we have several cruises scheduled this year one has already uh, being completed between March and May 2021. Um, another one is going out in August to November, sampling the same station structure off in Namibia and South Africa as in 2019. But they're connected to the Cape Verde Islands because the ship is um, going from Germany to Namibia due to um, corona restrictions and we're able to have hydroacoustic sampling on the way. So we will have hydroacoustic sampling of the deep scattering layers going from Cape Verde through the Angola Basin um, towards the Benguela upwelling system for spring 2021, uh, fall 2021, and maybe also in December, January this year. So there's lots of data coming up. And if you're interested in these kind of data, these kind of analysis, um, please let me know. I'm very, very excited to share experiences and data and um, analysis on this. So if you have more questions, answers, details, please join the discussion on Thursday, 24th of June, 11 o'clock GMT time. Again, my name is Tim Dudek, and I'm very happy to take your questions and hope for a fruitful discussion. See you. Have a great day.